Thank you. Uh, so we're a little dark today, but we'll, we'll try to make do. Um, so thinking about scale, um, I wanted to talk about one project that I've been working on, um, kind of that came out of my graduate school research, and I've been working on it for the last couple years. Um, and it has to do with the way discrete objects relate to one another in new ways, um, and the way they can make new connections um, using new digital fabrication methodologies. So I don't know if you can recognize these, but when I was a kid, I was really into Puzz 3Ds. Does anyone, is anyone familiar with Puzz 3Ds? Okay, so they're these uh, foam-backed puzzle pieces. Um, there's New Schwanstein on the, the right and uh, Manhattan on the left. And they're basically, they're, they're like a puzzle that you can build vertically, um, but when I was little, I always wanted them to branch in multiple directions and, and really have more freedom. Um, and these are a bit hard to see. Oh, that's a little better. So when I was coming out of graduate school um, in architecture and landscape architecture, I was doing a lot of, working with a lot of projects that involved many types of discrete geometries and thinking about ways to organize them. So large data sets um, of geometry. Um, they were all kind of related uh, within some type of uh, complex system. But my, my yearning was really for the geometry to relate to, to um, the piece, individual pieces to relate to themselves as opposed to kind of a larger system in which they existed. Um, so coming uh, into this project, I was thinking about how we could make design assemblies to have new connection types so that you could work with discrete pieces of geometry and they would relate to one another um, in unconventional ways. Uh, so the, the top three diagrams show kind of um, a, a series of uh, components. Uh, so thinking about kind of not too dissimilar from a brick model, but a component that has uh, branches or U-shapes, male-female connections. Um, and I realized that that wasn't really the space filling type of uh, connection logic that I needed if I was gonna try to design a series of connections to, to fill uh, complex geometry. So on the bottom here, uh, which is a little hard to see, is basically the beginnings um, of an idea I developed that if, if, you, if we have complex geometry and we set down a number of lines on them, um, on, the, on the surface of the mesh, um, so you can see this series of lines here. Um, those lines can be used as center lines, what are known as center lines um, of pieces that get divided. So there's an algorithmic process that kind of reads all of these um, black lines and divides them up um, and starts to form the pieces of what become um, uh, different discrete geometries that can connect to one another. Um, so the result, a resulting piece might look like this or, or its neighbor, um, it's a little tough to see. Um, so the, the piece we just looked at is here, and its neighbor kind of has a parallel relationship and is locked uh, with a U connection. Um, and that's all the result of an original diagram in which a series of uh, center lines are, um, are applied to a mesh, and then we undergo kind of a, a piece generation algorithm. Um, so the first, the first kind of example I looked into was, was this dog. Well, actually, first I, I did a sphere because I wasn't sure if it, would, if it would work. And so I developed these two dogs. And it's a little tricky to see on, in these pictures, but the, the images of, on the left are, are this dog, and the images on the right are this dog. And through a couple months, um, I developed basically a, a toolkit of understanding um, in terms of what type of um, connect, what the connection types need to be for geometries that traverse complex curvature. And there are four connection types that um, became apparent. The first is the, the A type, which is a male, typical male-female joint. Um, then there's the kind of double female joint in which we have two U's connecting geometry. Um, a connection type C has um, one U that interlocks two pieces. Um, and then those, are all, those can all go into multiple groupings. So these three connection types can be used in different, um, on, on different types of mesh curvature for, for optimal connections. So for example, this uh, the C connection, you can see in this top diagram, this is the back of the dog, and we have a U here and, and two inter, inter, um, insertions um, just to the right of it. So, this particular connection is traversing a lot of kind of complex curvature. Um, the C connection is great at, at handling that curvature, but it provides a weak stability. 
Um, so each piece needs to be connected to at least two or three others. And through, the, through a series of kind of iterations, um, moving from, from this dog to this dog, um, I developed uh, about 10 or 12 rules that needed to be written into the algorithm that can produce these pieces. Um, so the resulting um, process is, um, leaves you with kind of a series of pieces. They're a third of an inch thick. Um, and the, the figure is actually hollow on the inside. So it's as if you take a jig, uh, jigsaw puzzle and wrap it, around, um, wrap it around a figure. So here's a video of the dinosaur. Oops, let me see if I can start that over. Um, so the dinosaur is 21 pieces. They're kind of all abstract geometries and they fit together. They all have an order. Um, due to the kind of uh, extreme curvature of the pieces, they need to be assembled in a particular order, which you could see in the previous slide. Um, but the goal of the project is to kind of move up in scale and up in, uh, in piece number. Um, the bust here is something that's getting there. Um, I'm working on a couple projects in which uh, the assemblies become larger and larger as the system has become more and more automated. Um, some pavilion style, uh, pavilion scale and installation scale projects. So the idea being that, um, bringing it back to kind of the school of architecture, if we can think about new ways of creating connections between building units, um, then we can, then we could have a building unit, a set of building units that are inextricably linked to the form of a building. Um, and that can have a lot of advantages. It could have advantages in terms of production. It could have advantages in terms of structural capacity. So you could um, variate the density of your building units. Um, you could have less material where you need less material. Um, the general idea is that our building units are able to understand um, the facade and the curvature and the underlying geometry of the building. And we can produce those units as needed. Um, so all of these are 3D printed as you could probably tell. And one of the great things about digital fabrication and in particular 3D printing is the, um, the machine doesn't care whether your, um, your geometry is different or not. So when we're working with a complex mesh and it's spitting out 100 or 200 different pieces of geometry, we're really leveraging the power of the printer um, because it doesn't take any more work to produce 100 different units, um, unique units in terms of geometry than it takes um, to produce 100 of the exact same units. If you're using a printer or, or a CNC process or an, any other, well, or several other types of digital fabrication. So the, pro the project tries to leverage um, digital fabrication to, to create um, new objects, new geometries that would not be able to be created in any other way. Um, another interesting thing about the project that I wanted to, to just kind of mention is, um, is production and distribution. So as designers and architects, um, our profession has long kind of uh, operated in a way in which we, we design, um, if it's a product, we'll design a product, we'll make a prototype, and then we'll need help with production, whether it's injection molding or, or um, whatever the production process is. Generally, we hand um, the work off to the actual producer. Um, they do the production and handle retail. Um, and it can be a tricky financial situation for the designer. The same is true if you're an architect designing a building. You know, as architects, we produce drawings for buildings, but we don't actually produce the buildings. Um, and that's, that's um, made for a lot of drawbacks, both financially and kind of uh, professionally for, for us to progress in, in certain situations. In other situa situations, it works out fine. Um, so printing and other digital fabrication techniques are really helping uh, designers kind of get around those limitations. Um, so the printer allows me to design this and take it directly to market. Um, in terms of production scale, that was obviously an issue. Um, and I started working with a company called 3D Hubs. I don't know if anyone's heard of this company, but basically they're a network of 3D printers. And, and this slide says 13,000. Now they have 16,000 printers across the world. And the idea is you can go on their site, you can find a product and you can, you can buy it and it's printed through a printer that's local to you. Uh, if you're in a city, you can um, usually find a printer within a mile or two of your house. There's a couple hundred hubs in New York. Um, 
but there are a lot of there's a lot of kind of interest between designers and also companies like such as 3D Hubs that are looking at kind of local and distributed manufacturing techniques that are that are starting to change the way we think about uh, producing products, and that's been really helpful in this project. Um, so going back to let me see if I can get this started again. Um, going back to this idea of fully full automation, so and a little bit about how the algorithm works. Um, so if you imagine kind of, here, let's, let's get this um, starting again. Yes, so if you imagine each one of these kind of centers uh, or, or points in the middle is, it represents a piece with five arms. This is kind of the diagram of the center lines that I was pointing out earlier. And they're starting to understand the position and their relationship with their neighbors. And they're trying to create parallel relationships with their neighbors. And that's the kind of relationship um, that, I, that we need to create to get the kind of suitable, um, the suitable relationships of pieces. Um, so parallel and a parallel relationship in those three connection types is really what we're looking for. So this process is all being automated um, so that you could say, put a, a, an entire building shell or an installation, uh, a mesh that could be an installation into the simulation and spit out 500, 1,000 pieces, print those and build your kind of um, custom formed building. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out was kind of, and this is, um, a project I did in which uh, the kind of design technology is not uh, a real departure from what I've been talking about. Um, but in terms of production, getting back to production, uh, it's an interesting case study. Um, so in February, I did a, a project for Yahoo, and they wanted, um, they wanted 100 puzzles um, of their logo. And each one was 28 pieces and two feet tall. And it was about 2,500 hours of printing. Um, and they had about three weeks for design and production. So they really needed something for this event. Um, they had a limited amount of money and there was no time to cast or mold anything. Um, so we went through this kind of furious process in which I designed this thing. Um, I found 65 printers through 3D hubs. Um, and in, 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 over the course of 12 days, so kind of a long weekend of designing. And over the course of 12 days, we printed 100 of these. Uh, puzzles. So the puzzle kind of uh, works like this. Um, <laughs> again, we should start from the beginning. Um, and so 2,500 of hours, 2,500 hours of printing, we got done through the network. And I thought it was a really um, kind of cool case study of how um, local uh, distributed manufacturing can work. Um, there's no other way we could have produced um, this kind of scale of, of you know, a pretty nice product at a at a very reasonable price. Um, so, you know, leveraging the printing again to produce um, geometries that we otherwise couldn't produce in time scales that otherwise would be impossible. Um, so here's, um, well, they're hard to see, but a couple shots from the actual event and, um, and, it, and it worked out well. So uh, new types of manufacturing. So thank you.